Aloha. Can you hear me? Sorry. <laughs> Maybe I have to bring it closer to me. Sorry. Excuse me. I think that I think that'll work. Aloha. Mahalo for this opportunity um, to present before you. Um, uh, I just take a minute for myself um, as we. Uh, uh, aloha kia kua na. Okay, kia aloha vishoda. Kia aloha vishoda for Mauna Kea and Aina Hou. Uh, and for myself, I'm a cultural practitioner. Um, I just need a moment to um, speak about the sacred Mauna. Uh, Ikia kua na kua na oma kua. We welcome you to abide with us this day and bring blessings upon all in this room and all of those of goodwill and uh, aloha of the world. And we um, thank you for this honor to stand. Um, we ask for the blessings for your greatness and purpose. Aloha. Um, the purpose of a contested case hearing is so that petitioners like us, practitioners and people of the general public with an interest that is that is unique to the Mauna, be it uh, being a hunter, a recreational user, a practitioner, can come forward and make sure that we can present our case for, uh, for the, this board so that you can make an informed decision. Um, and to present how, how that decision will impact us. And how that decision impacts us is because, and, and, and the general public is important because um, our rights are, are protected by the Constitution and, and other law. Um, it's also a way to um, make sure that the public doesn't have to carry the burdens of going into litigation, for example. Anyways, the Supreme, the Supreme Court remanded us back to this place. Um, and uh, this hearing constitutes a huge endeavor of, you know, almost a year in legal proceedings, six months in um, 44 days of hearings, um, I think over about five months, uh, 70, 70 something witnesses, thousands of um, pages of documentations, and so on and so forth. So we were remanded back by the Supreme Court, but not because we did anything wrong, but because the board failed to um, give us due process and put the cart before the horse. Um, so we, we were not given that fair opportunity to be you know, me, fully heard and, and in a meaningful way heard, yes. So, but unfortunately, this hearing didn't, didn't fix that. The reason why it didn't is because the hearing officer, for all intents and purposes, just didn't do that consideration. She cut and pasted, basically, the university's and TIO's, TMT's positions. And what, what the problem with that is that it violates the raw law under 92-12, where each position... According to the university, there are over 5,000 findings of fact and conclusions of law combined. So she needed to actually look at those and make a ruling on those individually. I mean, I'm not saying that she, you know, if they were all related to one issue, I'm sure she could have combined them all. But she needs to respond to them because without responding to them, it takes away our right to ask for a motion for reconsideration. We don't even know what the problem is. And more importantly, it gives you... Uh, an incorrect idea of what this hearing was actually about because you don't see the facts involved. She took into consideration virtually nothing from any of our stuff. And I don't know how that's possible. I mean, for Mauna Kea and Ainaho, we've, we've gone through three, three contested case hearings, I think four actually, over a 20-year period, and we've won in both federal and state court and we've been, got, even the Supreme Court ruled on our behalf. So I, I cannot see, it's not possible for the hearing officer not to take into account any of our arguments or our positions or anything like that. So we just take exception 
to that. And we have to accept uh, and object to her findings in whole until we recommend maybe that you remand her back to do it. I mean, the taxpayers paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for her to do that job. So, um, anyways. Uh, There's two important things that I want to talk about, and one of them is um, the responsibilities of this board um, from the perspective of Kapa'akai. BLNR, you're the only agency who's able to protect and enforce our rights, Native Hawaiian rights. No other agency can do that. What's happened here is we've been caught up in a jurisdictional confusion between the university and BLNR and each one not knowing what the other is supposed to do or allowed to do. What's, what's brought that, um, this jurisdictional confusion also has resulted in BLNR, you delegating your authority and Kapa'akai specifically barred that. Because BLNR and BLNR alone can delegate our, uh, can um, regulate and enforce our rights. So only you can do that. So it, it's been delegated in many ways. It's been delegated to the University of Manoa, then to the University of Hilo, then to Office of Mauna Kea Management, then Kahukumauna. Now, none of those agencies are allowed to regulate or enforce our rights, only BLNR can. So Kapakai specifically said that you must do three things. You have to identify the rights and resources of Native Hawaiians. You have to assess the impact to those. And then you have to implement protections for those. Now that can't be done because the university did it for you. You have to do it. Because the university obviously is going to select in on behalf of, of what they're, propo- pr- they're the proponents of, the development. That's why you folks must do it. Okay, and the other thing about Mauna Kea that is, is, is very, very important is that it's our water source. And the public trust doctrine not only protects our rights, but also our resources such as our water. So... It holds, yeah, that the state, when having to balance the two between a use and a protection, right, that you have to go on the presumption uh, and in favor of public use and access and enjoyment. So your job first is not to protect a development, but protect the resource against development. And to balance that, to balance that, what, what it also means is under the public trust doctrine, the public's use always is, is superior to the private use. It doesn't mean the private use can't be done, but under the public trust doctrine, you have to f- go with the presumption and in favor of the protection. Um, also, in determining this, you have the precautionary principle the precautionary principle in short is saying that if you in the absence of conclusive evidence to the contrary you must side um, with the protection and so um, it's not our right also to prove that the impact will occur it's the proponent's right who's seeking to take that resource to prove that it won't it's the dispo- despoiler's obligation to protect um, and to prove that what they want to do will not affect our rights. It's not our job. That was also very important here, is the unlawful shifting of the burden of proof. It is not our burden of proof. It is the opposition's, but the hearing officer unilaterally shifted the burden onto us. We're not, we're not the criminal here. Okay, and so um, I believe the court remanded us back. They specifically warned against cutting and pasting. They had said that it demonstrated that the board did not do their due diligence in consideration. They specifically stated 
that, um, sorry, I don't think I can find it right here, but they specifically warned against that is what I really want to say. And um, it's in our exceptions. Um, We stand on our exceptions at this point. And um, I did reserve time for rebuttal. And I would like to just say that um, we really take exception to the hearing officer's failure to take into account the, the evidence presented. I mean, it's thousands of documents. These are not only our documents. They're their documents. They're the university and TIO's document. So they admit these things. The, it's not our burden You know, we're just there to say, hey, they can't meet the A criteria, and here's why. And and it is our position that they can't meet not only some of the criteria, but they cannot meet any of it. Thank you. Thank you. Next up. Um, Okay, my first um, rebuttal is to make objection to um, Mr. Ng of the TIO's um, assertion of or interpretation and mischaracterization of my my testimony. Um, make no mistake, there is an injury, um, and there's a continued injury, and there will be another injury in addition if the TMT is built. In 1998, my ahu, my family ahu, was taken and destroyed. It was taken to the Hilo dump, n- never to be returned. Three different times. It was taken by university personnel. One of those incidents involved uh, destroying and desecrating my auntie's ashes in her burial place. That is my traditional burial place. And I am a cultural uh, and lineal descendant of Mauna Kea and Mauna Kea Nainaho is made up of cultural and lineal descendants with genealogical ties to Mauna Kea. That desecration didn't end. It ended with one apology, but it continued. It's been desecrated and it continued. In fact, three stones have been replaced and all have been taken. Our lele on the summit has been destroyed Many times, so many times, we have to bring one when we go to do ceremony. It's hacked down. In our case, the Office of Mauna Kea Management um, admitted to doing some of these acts. Now, there was comment about building new ahus. Well, they're not new. They're of the old bringing into the new. That is exactly what PASH allows us to do to continue our practice. And if you want to know where to find that out, it's in their own documents in the master plan, um, Appendix N. You will find all of these practices that you're hearing about and that have been carried on in this hearing. What it means is that this is a continued injury. What What... My stuff was logged in 1998. We're talking about today, it's still happening. And that's because of this jurisdictional confusion and the unlawful delegation of the board, the board giving this this obligation to an entity that's not legally mandated to enforce it. Now, we're not trying to establish any religion. It's another point. We're trying to continue a religion that goes on since time immemorial. Okay? Now, what Doug Ng forgot to mention is those practices that we do on the summit are solstice and equinox practices. And they have been being done for 26,000 years. And what is required of those practices is our ability to connect to the, the range of the sun and the movement of the sun so that we can track the 26,000 year cycle when the universe relatively spins and comes back to point zero. We just completed one of those and all of the indigenous cultures around the world remember that 
because they were recording that and so were we. And make no mistake, if the TMT is built, we will not be able to do that ceremony. And that is very well documented in all of our documentation. We're not seeking special rights. The court recognized that these rights predated the existence of the United States occupation of Hawaii. So all they did was say that we had a right to continue those practices. So we're not asking for special treatment or special rights. These aren't special rights. They're not even rights under American law per se. They're rights because America came here and occupied and the court had to uphold that the Admissions Act gave us this right because we are actual title holders. We're right holders. That's what it said in the Admissions Act for the betterment and condition of Native Hawaiians. So we're not asking for special rights or rights that exclude anybody. We're just trying to practice our rights. And the last and most important point, I think, is that they're supposed to follow county, state, and federal law. They need to do Section 106, and that's contained in our our exceptions also. The last point is I want to reserve all of our rights. Um, I would ask you to please call for a stay um, if you choose to ap- approve this, because to do otherwise is to show contempt, I think, for the people who are willing to put their lives on the line and also for the court, because the court has, we have a right to have the court review any of the decisions of this body. Thank you. Prashetti, I'm sorry, Prashetti? Prashota? Prashota. It's okay, don't worry, you did good. (laughs) Yes. I wonder if you could uh, elaborate a little bit more for me on uh, your testimony of an HRS 92-12 public agency meetings and records and enforcement. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, I can't wait. Let me, let me grab the statue. One second. Mm-hmm. Hold on, sorry, I have to find it. I forgot, this, my copy doesn't have page numbers. Okay, yes, I have it. Do you want me to? Yeah, okay. Um, it basically says every decision and order that is adverse to a party, uh, to a proceeding rendered by an agency shall be in writing or stated in the record, and shall be accompanied by a separate filing of fact and conclusion of law. If any party to the proceeding has filed proposed findings of fact, the agency shall incorporate it in its decision in a ruling upon each each proposed finding of fact um, so presented. So that's HRS uh, 91-12. So the point was is that the hearing officer didn't rule on the vast majority of our evidence because they cut and pasted the university's and TIO's positions. And therefore, um, because we have no ruling, we're forced to guess why. We have no way of filing a motion for reconsideration, for example, um, to say we disagree um, and here's why, or to say it was misunderstood, here's more information, or anything like that. Um, We're just left without any remedy, pretty much, other than to say, well, we we provided all of this information, here it is, all over again. And that was an excessive burden for us to grab all of our information relating to each of these facts and say, okay, we gotta redo, I mean, this is why it's this big, you know? Um, So, that, that was, that's our objection. And that's why we believe that perhaps you should remand it back to her so that she can actually do that. Um, because it isn't a matter of just looking at it and th- dismissing it. You have to say, you're dismissing it and here's why. 
and don't get me wrong, I don't expect her to, you know, she can take a group of facts and say why this group of facts she's rejecting. But she needs to let us know she's rejecting it so that we have some opportunity to, you know, object to that and say here's, here's why we object to that. And that, that can become a part of an appeal, for, for example. But now we have to say we object to her whole finding because she didn't take into account and she just cut and pasted. And, you know, um, this is what the Supreme Court said about that. Um, it basically said, let me just read you the first part. It said a couple parts. Because when they remanded it back, they were specifically noting that the conditions enunciated in BLNR's findings of fact conclusions in law in 2013 were virtually the same as in 2011. This similarity is significant because BLNR appears to suggest that in 2011 they anticipated serious consideration of evidence presented during the contested case hearing. But the similarities between 2011 and 2013 decision gives the appearance that less than full consideration was given to the voluminous legal, factual arguments and materials presented in the contested case hearing. Such live similarity gives the appearance that BLNR had already prejudged the case and that the ultimate determination of the merits had moved in predestined grooves, citing this famous Cinderella case. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for the clarification. Sure.